Hi everyone, your chess puzzler here, and welcome to the channel. Today is all about this guy. This is one of his very last pictures before he passed, and this is what he looked like when he first started. He started playing chess at the age of six, and by the age of 15 was the US champion. Fisher became a genius when he came to chess, but he was not born a genius. He studied the game very hard, but he also said he hated chess. But how much is true of what he said? Maybe this is something we can address later. Robert Fisher has over 1,000 games on record. And what I want to do is to look at where it all started. And to do this, we need to go back to 1953 and go to New York, where Fisher was based. His first game on record is against this gentleman, who's no longer with us. And this picture was taken in 2010 during his game against Holland Murray. He died in 2014 at the age of 91. Who was he? Dan was a physicist who worked on the Manhattan Project and also appears to have played his first game when he met Fisher. And by the way, this was a blitz game. And though I don't really want to go more into his life, I will not mention he was a professor, he was a black belt, and many, many other things. So today we have Dan Mayer and Robert Fisher, both playing the first ever official game that is on record, of course. Dan White kicked it off with the most widely used opening at the time. And Fisher responded with also the number one move at the time. It was either this or the Sicilian. And here we have the King's Gambit, which is now rarely played. One thing about the King's Gambit is these games are wide open and quite short. Takes, and rather than the usual knight at three, Dan got his bishop out, eyeballing Black's weaker spot. Fisher's response, knight of six. And now when the knight was developed, Fisher went for this move, most definitely preparing to attack this bishop. After d4, I guess Fisher could have gone for this bishop, but chose something else. Do you want to have an educated guess? He pinned the knight. And when this knight was attacked, Fisher used the pin and goes for this. How did Dan reply here? One way to do this is to develop the knight to e2, but Dan tries a more risky approach. He went for this and is looking for a mating one. But of course black has castles or g6 and the problem instantly disappears. Fisher thought best to castle and when the knight came out to e2, it was the turn of this bishop to be attacked. Bishop back got now the queen attacked. And when the queen squatted right into h6, is black possibly in any trouble? If he thought he was, then this queen will get the queens off. So Fisher went for this move instead. Dan didn't want to castle and was probably hoping to push on this h-pawn all the way as far as he can get him to allow the queen and rook to get together. But let's look at something else. What if this guy on f4 is arrested? And what if the bishop does the execution? And this I think is going to land you in big trouble. There is bishop takes, and when the king captures, there is bishop takes, pawn takes, and when the knight removes this poor guy with a check, will you tell me how white is going to come out of this one in one piece? And even if he does manage to count on this one, it is going to be an uphill struggle. Okay, let's come back to see what really happened here. Dan went for this response. But is it better than what we have just seen? Knight takes, king takes, and there are two key moves, not one. But which one of the two key moves did Fisher fish out? Neither. 
One is bishop takes, and when the king captures, after f6, whether you take or not, nothing much changes. If you remove f6, after queen takes, there is rook f1, but when this guard d4 comes off, this square on e3 cannot be covered. At best, I think there is rook f3, but after this, white is busted. Even if you go chasing after the queen, what do you think follows when the rook comes in with this check? There is knight e4, but when the rook takes with the check, the rook has to step in to block, but after he's gone too, there is king back to base, but with this final move, black mates very easily, and let's hear it. Coming back, when the king removed the knight, black here has 1,001 ways of winning this one. But with Fisher being relatively inexperienced, what do you think he did? He blundered and blundered big time. And from a totally winning position, Look how fast things change. It was down to one move. And the cause of this is this push to g5. After this venomous thrust, Fisher took, Dan took, and he must have seen this bishop would have been able to come into f5 and h7 is automatically protected. So this is exactly what he did. And you know what they say? You can only learn and get better provided you are able to pick up the pieces from your own mistakes. When Mayers lined up his other rook on this file, there is in fact no way you can prevent disaster. At best, maybe rook e8 to allow the bishop to retreat and attack the queen. But maybe even go for this. Fisher panicked here and went right after the rook. And it was game over in no more than two moves. Dan found the way to beat young Fisher. But if you were to step into Dan's shoes, would you be able to copy what he did? Let's try, shall we? In two, one, and pause. Does queen takes h7 work. After bishop takes and rook takes, it seems white might be able to mate, but he's a move too short. If f6, this does not seem to work in favour of white because after knight takes, f takes, the position is complicated. But just look at how important this bishop is on b3. After knight takes, c takes, and bishop takes check, once the queen captures him, removing the queen might be winning. I don't think you really need to take her. Just try this. Rook h8 check. King f7. This check. And when the king goes into hiding, now is a good time to remove the queen. And it is in fact job done. Black may seem to have many pieces, but what good are they if they're all locked up? I'm not going to rush these variations through. What I can do is to illustrate to satisfy those who might have questions. Rook takes, rook takes, check. And if king f7, there is d takes. And now after a5 to try and liberate the rook. There is rook a7. But when this knight also comes off. You should be able to get there in the end. But let's come back to the actual game. Because Dan found the shortcut here. He came in with this check. And we know if the rook is removed. The queen mates on h7. A best fisher has bishop g5. But after takes. If king h8. Queen g7 is a mate. Queen takes rook. And queen takes queen. And if now this. When this guy in f4 comes off. Black is not able to hold. But when the rook came in with this check. 
You can hardly believe this was Bobby Fischer playing with the black pieces cause this is what he did. And of course Dan used the pin to make Bobby Fischer with this and who would ever have imagined Bobby Fischer to become the player he was. And it's not at all unusual big names losing games like this. In fact, Bobby Fischer, and let me make a correction, was not a big name at the time. No one knew who Bobby Fischer was, and not even Bobby Fischer knew who Bobby Fischer was. Now there is plenty of info on Dan Mayers. There appears to be a huge gap between his first game in 1953 and his second game that was played in 1978. Where was he hiding all this time? We know he was very busy, well travelled, but what we also know is that he never played Fisher ever again. So in fact, he's one of the very few people who managed to beat Fisher and went to the grave with a positive score. Of course, when Fisher became the player and possibly one of the best players the world has ever seen, Dan Mayers would have stood no chance. But Fisher is no different to other great GMs, who also lost their very first game when they started, and this game today is no different. I will be back with more, so until next time, this was your Chess Puzzler.